I would uh, like to welcome His Holiness Chandramoli Swami Maharaj. We are very fortunate to have him on this Bhakti Sangha Japa conference call. Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj. And um, we will proceed to our next session, which is um, Bhagavatam study. And Maharaj is going to enlighten us from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 25, Verse 7 and 8. Whenever you're ready, Maharaj. Mataji, Aditi Mataji will do introduction. Is it okay, Maharaj? Can Aditi Mataji do your introduction? Maharaj, you are not audible. Mm. We've done that so many times, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Okay, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj, whenever you're ready, you can take the call over. I need to put the uh, verse up on the board. Okay, so here. So this chapter is entitled The Glories of Ananta, Ananta Dev, which is a uh, the multi headed serpent at the bottom of the universe, which is an expansion of Lord Balaram, actually, who is an expansion of Lord, I mean, who, expansion of Lord Shankarshan, who is an expansion of Lord Balaram. Mm, so here we have the uh, prose. So we'll go right into the translation. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Sukadev Goswami continued. The demigods, the demons, the Uragas, Serpentine demigods, the Siddhas, the Gandharvas, the Davidyadharas, and many high elevated stages constantly offer prayers to the Lord because he, referring to Anantade, is intoxicated. The Lord looks bewildered and his eyes, appearing like flowers in full bloom, move to and fro. He pleases his personal associates, the heads of the demigods, by the sweet vibrations emanating from his mouth. Dressed in bluish garments and wearing a single earring, he holds a plow on his back with his two beautiful and well-constructed hands. Appearing as white as the heavenly King Indra, he wears a golden belt around his waist and a Vijanti garland of ever flesh Tulsi blossoms around his neck. Bees intoxicated by the honey-like fragrance of the Tulsi flowers hum very sweetly around the garland, which thus becomes more and more beautiful. In this way, the Lord enjoys his very magnanimous pastime. So there's a nice description of the uh, form of uh, Lord Anantadev in his, uh, how he dresses, how he looks, how he acts. Mm -hmm. Okay, verse number eight. If persons who are very serious about li being liberated from material life hear the glories of Anantadev from the mouth of the spiritual master in the chain of the Siddhic succession, and if they always meditate upon Sankarsana, the Lord enters the core of their hearts, vanquishes all dirty contamination of the material modes of nature, and cuts to pieces the heart not within the heart which has been tied tightly since time immemorial by the desire to dominate material nature through food activities. Narada Muni, the son of Lord Brahma, always glorifies Lord Anantadev in his father's assembly. Therefore, he sings blissful verses of his own composition. 
who accompanied by a string instrument or a celestial singer known as Tumburu. Purport, none of these descriptions of the Lord Anantadev are imaginary. They're all transcendentally blissful and full of actual knowledge. However, unless one hears them directly from a bona fide spiritual master in the line of the cyclic succession, one cannot understand them. This knowledge is delivered to Narada by Lord Brahma and the great saint Narada, along with his companion, Tumbuda, distributes it all over the universe. Sometimes the Supreme Personality God is described as Uttama Sloka, one who is praised by beautiful poetry. Narada composes various poems to glorify Lord Ananta. And therefore, the word samlokayam asa, which means praised by selected poetry, is used in this verse. The Vaishnavas and the Gaudiya Sampradaya belong to the disciplic succession stemming from Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma is the spiritual master of Narada. Narada is the spiritual master of Vyas, and Vyas wrote the Srimad Bhagavatam as a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. Therefore, all devotees in the Gaudiya Sampradaya accept the activities of Lord Ananta related in the Srimad Bhagavatam as authentic, authentic. And thus they are benefited by going back home, back to Godhead. The contamination of the heart of a conditioned soul is like a huge accumulation of garbage created by the three modes of material nature, especially in the modes of passion and ignorance. This contamination becomes manifest in the form of lusty desires and greed for material possessions. As confirmed herein, unless one receives transcendental knowledge in a specific succession, there is no question of his becoming purified of this contamination. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutalai Sri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaunga Mani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pastyakya De Sakarine Vanchakopa Thurugascha Kipa Sindhu Devacha Vitanam Bhavane Vyong Vaishnava Vyana Mahona Mahajai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakti Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare So material Association means contamination. Just like we regularly take a bath every day, at least once a day, sometimes twice, because we want to cleanse the body just by living in the material world, the body becomes uh, what we say need, in need of cleansing. And the body itself, is made up of very, what we say, unmentionable substances that exude out of the skin and make the body, what we say, even more contaminating <laughs> and even more repugnant. <laughs> and that is the material body. And, and then, of course, the soul, which is represented in this material world by the mind, gets contaminated due to its association with the three modes of material nature. Now, these modes of material nature are considered to be like dirt. <laughs> and there's different degrees of that covering. And it's like you can be filthy dirty, you can be a little dirty, and you can be just, you know, slightly touched with the dirt. So in all the three modes, there is contamination. The contamination causes one, causes the soul 
to be afflicted by the characteristics that make up the different modes, such as the mode of passion is lusty desires and uh, anger and um, illusion. And the mode of ignorance is also illusion, greed, envy, pride. And all of these in the material and uh, the, the contamination of the mode of uh, goodness, this false sense of happiness, <laughs> and based on the association with the external energy where the mind and the senses contact the external objects of the senses formulated by the intelligence, which is a more subtle form of contamination, but still, it's still contaminating. So in the material world, we are kind of dirty, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> That's to use a nice word. So the cleansing process has to come. And therefore, one of the qualities characteristics of dirtiness is illusion. What is that illusion? We think we're this material body. And we think that through the activities in the material world, we can find happiness. This is illusion because we're neither in this material body. We are distinct from the body and we live within the body. We are the pure soul. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, my vai vom sao jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana masa stani indriyani prakriti stani karshati. We struggle in this material world to live, but we are his parts and parcels, spiritually pure in nature, but covered by the contamination of the three modes of material nature, which is illustrated by having a particular type of body. So that this illusion uh, carries off in the form of ignorance. So what is that ignorance? Well, we uh, sometimes when we read the scriptures, we think that the scriptures are hyperboles or exaggerations, eulogies over over glorifications or overstatements. And when we hear something that sounds a little bit fantastic from our perspective, we kind of doubt its uh, veracity, its authenticity. And therefore, we honestly sometimes become a little faithless in our uh, understanding of truth. And therefore, um, as it says here, before we can become somewhat clarified from that illusion and get to the pl platform of real knowledge, it's illustrated here that the Supreme Personality of Godhead takes the form of a multi-headed snake. And on the head of that snake, all the universes throughout existence are sitting on the head of the snake. The snake is so big that he doesn't even know how many universes are on his head, nor did he, does he feel any weight from these universes, although he's carrying them. He is so big and so powerful. He's pure white in color, and he has a, uh, he's dressed in light blue garments. His eyes roll as if intoxicated. He has a beautiful smile on his face. And uh, he wears garlands. He has a Vajanti garland. And he also wears a belt made out of various precious jewelry. Now, one would think, wow, that sounds a little fantastic. Sounds like somebody came up with some imagination, and now here it is as some kind of factual statement within scripture. But the scriptures don't exaggerate. Mm -hmm. Scriptures give us the exact understanding, and sometimes they even fall short in giving what is actually there in terms of the uh, understatement. In other words, in their glorification, they don't glorify even to the level that is required. 
But these statements, when it comes to descriptions of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, or even his pure devotees, like Lord Brahma, Lord Brahma has four heads, at least in our universe and other universes, he has eight, 12, 100, 500, 1,000, 10,000, 10 million heads. Well, you might think, how is, how is it possible that a body could have 10 million heads? You know? <laughs> well, again, we are, we are working from our limited perspective. And therefore, when we use our limited understanding to understand something which is beyond the range of limitation, we, uh, and we did either fall short or we doubt. <laughs> well, and that is quite common also. Right now. So uh, therefore, it says here, by hearing from the bona fide spiritual master, because that hearing is a form of washing the contamination due to the association of these three modes. It's like taking a bath. When you hear from the, from the guru, you're also hearing from Krishna, as Krishna is represented by his pure spiritual master. When the guru speaks, he speaks what Krishna would speak. He doesn't concoct anything. He doesn't uh, have his own program. He simply is a representative of the, of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And when he speaks, he illustrates words from the Shastras. You'll see when Srila Prabhupada would give a lecture, sometimes he would be quoting verses to support his lecture every few minutes or even less regularly reciting the scriptures just to give authenticity and to give validations to what he is saying and that is uh, important so when the guru speaks he uh, is purifying and also educating he's doing both at the same time and when that purification comes, it comes by awakening the chip potency within our heart, which is the knowledge potency, which is intrinsic in the soul's existence. In other words, the soul is already full of knowledge. So what we get from the outside is just uh, finding its way into the inside, or inside, inside means the soul. And the soul is actually resonating with that. And then it comes alive based on that knowledge or its awareness becomes more and more developed until it's fully aware. And so this is the process. And therefore, therefore this Prabhupada cautions us not to doubt what we hear from these scriptures as being something that is untrue or just fanciful imagination of somebody who uh, somehow or other created it, or an exaggeration of the reality. These are actual facts. When um, Krishna spoke to Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna at one point during the narration said that, you know, you're saying you're the Supreme Personality of Godhead, pure and and uh, supreme in all aspects. And not only are you saying it, but also others are also saying it. So these Shastras are confirmed by the great souls, such as Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, Srila Jiva Goswami, Srila Sridhar Swami, uh, and many, many other commentators who give uh, further knowledge into the scriptures by their deep understanding of these verses. And when it comes to descriptions, it is uh, factual because this knowledge is coming from, this is called Avaroha. There's Aroha and then there's Avaroha. One means coming down, the other one means going up. 
So avaroha means coming down and aroha means going up. One is knowledge given by the senses and empirical observation, historical development, and logic. And the coming down is called sabda. Sabda means pure sound. And that is coming from higher authority, ultimately Krishna himself, who is the Adi Guru, the original spiritual teacher. So when we hear from these scriptures, we're getting it from pure sources. We don't have to do any research to see if it's correct or not. We can do research just to confirm it, but we don't have any, we don't, or to understand it better, but we don't need to do any research in order to prove its authenticity because it's already been proven by the great souls and practiced and illustrated in the, in the science of bhakti as a fundamental principle. So here we're hearing about the glories of Anantadev. He is so uh, beautiful. Uh, it says that he is pure white. It's interesting they gave an analogy connecting him to Indra as white as the king of, Hindra, king of heaven, Indra. So obviously Indra is of that pure white color. In here, it's the main, the Lord is giving, is being indicated in, in a comparative way. Because maybe we don't know, we don't know, but maybe we can understand through reference. Just like, um, give you an example in Vedic culture. When the uh, girl who is newly married to her husband, she goes to live at the house of the mother of the husband. And uh, how she learns how to take care of her husband from the mother of the husband who teaches her own daughter. So she teaches her daughter-in-law through teaching her daughter. This is the culture in India. Yeah. So this is how knowledge is knowledge of what is the husband, how to serve the husband is given to the, the wife through the mother who teaches it to her own daughter. And she's also preparing her own daughter at the same time for her, for her marriage. So this is an interesting arrangement. Um, so we can understand that, yes, when we hear these, this knowledge, it's coming from, it's coming from Krishna, but it's coming through the pure devotees of the Lord who have heard directly from Krishna. And that is our source of knowledge. And as we continue to hear, then realization on the knowledge will automatically start to develop. And realization comes by continuous hearing and by practicing Krishna consciousness. As we practice our devotional service and hear regularly, both of these two must work together as a unified force to awaken our knowledge of Krishna. Then gradually, the knowledge is no longer theoretical anymore. It's realized. We might give an example, just like when you're eating. As you're eating, your nourishment is increasing. Your hunger is decreasing. And you're uh, feeling happy by the taste of the food. So this is all happening in the eating process. So in the bhakti process, yes, as we continue to hear and practice, then arterial contamination is decreasing. Uh, our connection with Krishna is happening. And at the same time, we're becoming transcendentally satisfied. <laughs> well, this is the process of devotional service. If we take to it, and as we mentioned here, the most important principle that's being illustrated here is to hear regularly from the spiritual master. This is a, a very essential 
uh, principle of advancement. Because if we don't, then we may hear from other sources and then we'll get maybe a wrong or an incorrect version of what is being said. And there's a lot, there's a lot of people who are in the, in the name of a spiritual master who like to speak and also have followers, but they're not qualified because they don't have, they're not connected in disciplic succession to Krishna. And therefore, they write their own books or come up with their own philosophical teachings, or they go to the authorized teachings and give out a screwed up meaning. They just take the real meaning and give it a twist to make it sound new or different or even better. So that, that is very prominent in this age. Uh, there are many in the name of Guru. But if we want, therefore, when we hear from our own spiritual master, we can say, yes, this is correct. And therefore, what's happening is that as we read the scriptures and hear the scriptures, the scriptures become part of our consciousness. They're no longer separate. We start to imbibe them and they become a characteristics of our own personality after some time. We develop spiritual personality simply by the hearing process. So that's the process. Okay, any questions or comments? Thank you, Maharaj for the very precise and very valuable class as always. My humble obeisance is at your lotus feet. Yes, it's pretty bewildering trying to understand that uh, in one of the universes, Brahma can have 10 million heads. And it's so nice that you reminded us that by listening every time to Krishna Katha, to our scriptures, we develop a spiritual personality. So how important it is to listen, listen, listen. Thank you for emphasizing all the points, Maharaj. This, this really helps and uh, it, hopefully it will bring in, into our system, into, our, into the mind, body, and soul. Uh, may I kindly request the, part, uh, the participants, the devotees, to please go ahead and sh unmute yourselves and share your videos. Maharaj would like to see you and do not hesitate to go ahead and ask questions, please. I, do, I don't see any questions from anybody, Maharaj. Everybody has become sublime. Mm. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Dandavat Pranam, Maharaj. Uh, wonderful class. Thank you so much for the wonderful class and for your association. We are so fortunate to have your association, Maharaj. Please bless us so that we can get the bhakti and always be in devotional service. Hare Krishna, Dandavat Pranam Maharaj. Hare Krishna, my basis is so all you. the mercy of Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Dandavat Pranam. Thank you. So I have a question from uh, Jyoti Mataji, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Pranam Maharaji. Could you please share what will keep our chanting consistent and have a strong sankalp? Mm -hmm. Well, the sankalp is what's going to keep it consistent. <laughs> and what that means is it says that we should make a vow I'm going to improve my chanting. I will focus on quality chanting. I will 
do whatever I have to do in order to bring about quality chanting. And I will make the arrangements. In other words, the sankalpa is, I want to perfect my chanting. Let me explore deeper the whole principle of quality chanting and apply it every day to my day-to-day -day japa. So it has, it's, it's a focused desire, eka vrata, focus, one-pointed. And when you do that, you'll see, you can apply this to any, to any particular aspect of life. And when you focus on something in life, and you give it all the attention and knowledge that is required, then you become good at it, in general. Focus on it. Read books about how to increase, increase, increase the quality of your chanting. Hear the lectures about chanting. Review the different points that are given. And when you practice, make sure that you are in that same mood. We should always be in a positive mood when we chant and not in a negative mood, thinking it's so difficult or I can't chant. This will cause us to become less enthusiastic and at the same time will bring about a kind of a defeatist attitude. We should think today will be my the best rounds I've ever chanted. We should think like that every day. And do the need for Thank you, Maharaj. We, uh, Babu Prabhuji, just go ahead and you can unmute yourself and pose your question to Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tandavat Pranam, O Grace, Krishna Prabhupada, please accept my most humble obeisances. Yes, Maharaj, you mentioned um, knowledge from descending order and knowledge from ascending order. And knowledge, we understand knowledge from descending order is always superior and always the best. And um, I think Prabhupada quoted, um, it's a comment, it's not a question. Prabhupada quoted somewhere like, if we want to know who our father is, we need to ask um, to the mum, and they will be able to tell. But if we want to go by speculation, then we can do DNA sample on every man and it's going to take longer, longer period of time. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a good example. That's what Prabhupada used to help illustrate. You go right to the authority when you want the knowledge, instead of speculating in different ways and using the nati nati process, not this, not this, not this. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, thank you. Good point. Puja Mahadaji, if you would like to pose your question, please. Hare Krishna. Hello. Hare Krishna. Hare. I will, I will like to know ki, uh, that uh, what is the relation between Bhagavatam and the quantum world that I am studying right now? I had the curiosity to ask. Please. What, what is the relationship between Bhagavatam and quantum world? 
quantum word? Yes, sir. What is what what is your understanding of quantum word? What does that mean? Sir, we, um, Prabhuji, where the normal laws of the environment doesn't work, the different world from our world. Oh, you mean the the mundane? You mean? Yes, you can say that. Yeah, Bhagavatam is um, Amala Purana. Not Bhagavatam is an incarnation of Krishna himself in literary, in literary sound. Bhagavatam is coming by uh, the author is Vyasadeva, who has taken the Vedanta Sutras and presented Bhagavatam from that Vedanta Sutra. Bhagavatam is called Amalam Puranam, pure. It's free from Artha Kama Dhamma Moksha, in other words, the four activities of the human society. Whereas the opposite is all there in the mundane. So um, one is actually truth and the other one is simply speculation. Speculation will never help you. You can speculate forever and go from one situation to another, and you'll find yourself continuing to do that because there's no conclusion to speculation. Speculation just leads to more speculation. We speculate on an idea, and we get some idea on what it means, and then something else comes along and gives us a greater understanding of that same thing. And then we add that kind of speculation to it. And then something else comes along. And so we just keep speculating forever. Because in the material world, there's nothing conclusive. So the mundane or the quantum, something, quantum means something that is measurable. Mm -hmm. uh, the, spirit, the spiritual realm is not measurable. It's dynamic. It's what is called uh, ever-expanding, unlimited. So it's also called ananta. Ananta means... Unlimited, unlimited, unlimited. So, if you read Bhagavatam, you'll get you'll get the un, the correct understanding. If you hear from the quantum sector of society, or from society itself, it'll go on forever. You have so many philosophers, they all disagree with everybody else. <laughs> we have a question from Prahlad uh, Prabhu. Dandavat Maharaj, what does it mean in this um, Canto 5, chapter 25 in verse 7? And he put it in quotes, because he's intoxicated, the Lord looks bewildered and his eyes appearing like flowers in full bloom moved to and fro. He pleases his personal associates, the heads of the demigods by the sweet vibrations emanating from his mouth. How, why, and what kind of intoxication is this, Haribol? This, this word is used to describe those who are uh, absorbed in love of God. It's a kind of intoxication that causes one's exter external activities and appearance to be outside of the norm. Or an analogous to something that is of uh, a person who is uh, under the influence of something. 
So that under the influence of something in this case, he's under the influence of pure loving emotion. So it's described as being intoxicated. His eyes roll from side to side. His eyes look like they're blossoming flowers. You see, even in the material world, when somebody is so-called in love, they don't make sense a lot of times. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. I think I'm, on, I'm not in love yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. keep, keep going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ariwal. Well. Keep drinking that uh, elixir of transcendental knowledge and you'll become uh, inebriated. <laughs> sure, sure. Very well. We have a question from Devanand Prabhu, and he writes, Lord Krishna is unlimited. For example, today you talked about such an amazing aspect of him as the white serpent. At the same time, we say Krishna has six unit opulences, six unique opulences, all strength, all beauty, and so on. Are we limiting the unlimited Krishna by saying that he has only six opulences? Why not seven, not eight or 108 and, or not a million? <laughs> These are the prominent ones. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. But if you read the Nectar of Devotion, and we should read Nectar of Devotion, you find all, the, all of the qualities of Krishna. It mentions that there are 64 qualities of Krishna. Madhiza also compared to be opulences. But these are just the beginning. Even 64 is just a limitation. But then again, if you use the comparison within the material realm, and you take the opulences there and you apply them to Krishna, you see he has these opulences in full, in perfection. So it's just for us. But he has many more opulences. He can simply, which is not mentioned in his 64 opulences, he can simply desire and something happens. That's all. Thank you. We have a follow-up question from Jyoti Mataji, and she's requesting, Maharaj, you've mentioned about mood. You know, I request you, could you please share this in detail? This is requesting, what does the mood mean here when we say Krishna is in that mood or? Yeah, well, the word mood is obvious. Again, the mood of anger, the mood of, the mood of uh, lust, the mood of greed, the mood of, <laughs> when some particular this type of consciousness appears and it becomes prominent, we get into that mood, that's all. We have our moods too. And sometimes we say, this child is very moody. <laughs> We have a question from Hemi Mataji. Um, she says, Hare Krishna Maharaj, we think we are doing our best. Will there be indications in our devotional service which will tell us we are doing our best or not? Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to share what kind of indications, Prabhu Maharaj? What are the indications that we're doing our best? Yes. When we keep trying to do better. <laughs> Wonderful. Devotees, don't hesitate to unmute yourself, please. Go ahead, ask any questions that you might have while Maharaj is still here. Hare Krishna, Dhanvat Pranam. Hey, Ma. Hey, me. 
I just want to pay my, I just want to offer my obeisances and I want to say that I'm really eternally grateful to you because I was really looking for the answer of the mood I was not getting from the books. I wanted some practical answer and I got it today. Thank you. Mm, still yeah. not very clear with what what is the prominency, how we can find it because it's very difficult to find uh, that prominence in the mind. It, it, is, it is not that easy in the practical way, I mean. Moods may also appear in association with situations or with people. A particular mood may come about to us due to the association with a certain person, association with a certain activity. A mood may start to manifest accordingly. If we go to the temple, our mood generally turns to be more in the mood of prayer and the mood of worship. When we go to our relatives, then our mood is mostly gossip. <laughs> when we go to uh, we go to the store and we're shopping, our mood is to spend. <laughs> If you don't, if you if you go shopping and you don't have the mood to spend, you're just wasting your time. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. So we have to pre-plan our mood, right? We have yeah, to be dominant in that area. Yeah, and we can pre-plan it, but at the same time, it's also influenced to some degree. But there's some people who are not influenced by anything and they, they can bring their moods on and off. And that's, a, that's one who is highly intelligent. He knows how to control his moods or her moods. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, I, I have a uh, please accept. Uh, I have for my humble obeisances, Maharaj. I have a doubt that uh, if a devotee uh, somehow uh, somehow or the other by mistaken, if he falls down, can he still get the transcendental uh, bliss by doing the spiritual activities? Well, if he falls down, he just gets back up again. That's all. And if he begins his activities again, then he's no longer fallen. Falling means you slip from your activities, you commit some offense, you get back up, you rectify, and then you continue. Yeah, then you're no longer fallen anymore. Uh, thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yeah, don't stay down. Prabhupada used to say it's third class to fall down, it's first class to get back up. <laughs> When you get tired of falling down, then you you won't fall down anymore. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Anant Koti Tanvat Pranam to your lotus feet, Sila Prabhupada, Sila Gudev Kijay, Shishirata Kapinath Kijay. Maharaj, your money is uh, touched too hard. Maharaj, I have uh, one question. Uh, uh, can I ask Maharaj? Yes. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, material, uh, in a material world nowadays, whether it's office or home or outside, people are cheaters. They eat our hard work, money, like a Scorpio, jo, but when spiritual, those are practicing from seven, eight, nine years and they eat our hard work money and they are not returning our hard work money, then uh, what should our mood? We can only pray for that soul. But Prabhuji, uh, Maharaj, it's too much pain that 
spiritual those who are practicing from 7 8 years in a escon um, and they are not uh, return our hard work money then what should our mood from maharaj koti koti tender pranam shila prabhupad shila gurudev ki jai learn from my ma papa and grandma to forgive and forget but it is very painful because it's very hard work money and we save for a shishi rata kopinath lotus feet uh, that money and they are not returning so it's very painful that why spiritual those who are practicing spiritually and they are hurting so many matas in mata ji and prabhu ji's hard work money they eat what can you do you have to protect yourself from being cheated or harmed by them by being careful and they sometimes they say once burned twice shy we make a mistake one time with one person then we know oh, we can't trust when trust is not there then relationships break down so you have to develop relationships based on uh, the principle of trust <laughs> uh Mm, the yeah, i you said forgive and forget that may not always work forgive is there but forget don't forget don't <laughs> if you forget and you'll be doing the same thing again forgive and don't forget but forgive means to by don't forgetting you won't you won't make the same mistake again Yes, Maharaj Anand Koti Danvat Pranam to your lotus feet. We will um, follow your instruction, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hari Hari Goranga. You have to feel that you know these people that are doing that to you. You don't hate them, but you don't associate them with them either. Yes, Maharaj, we follow your instruction. Hari Hari Goranga. Thank you, Maharaj. Koti Koti Danvat Pranam. Hare Krishna. Anybody else who would like to pose last minute questions to Maharaj? I don't see any questions. No hands raised. Everybody's fully satisfied and content. <laughs> you are such a good host. <laughs> you, you make everyone feel good. <laughs> How much do you charge per hour? Oh no no. Hari. Hari. Maharaj your blessings Maharaj our charges your blessings and it's love. Okay. It's priceless. <laughs> yes that. Yes true. Maharaj. Maybe you can come on and instruct some of my devotees who do my program. They need some they need to hear from the hostess with the mostest <laughs> <laughs> no maharaj but i will i will take up on that if you need me for any of your services please don't hesitate to reach out okay i'm i'm okay. making i'm making a note of that <laughs> <laughs> i i maharaj. need so much more to get all rid of the of the material contaminations all over maharaj it in mind body soul everywhere aura is full of contamination we got to decontaminate okay <laughs> well anyway you do a wonderful job in presenting krishna consciousness that's nice you are so kind maharaj thanks for your blessings mm.
There was one Mataji wanted to say something. Yes, Maharaj, Sisi uh, Chagannath uh, Rathyatra in Atlanta Paniyati Dam at 4th July and next day Paniyati Festival. So Maharaj, please, can you please uh, talk a little bit about Sisi Chagannath Rathyatra? <laughs> we are so hungry to hear from you, Krishna Katha, Krishna Katha, Krishna Katha. You mentioned um, what dates? Uh, July 4th? Uh, 4th July. 4th July and 5th July. 4th July is uh, uh, Shri Shri Jagannath here, Rath Yatra in Atlanta, Pani Atidam. And the 5th oh, July no. is uh, uh, 4th June. Please forgive me. After 10 days. 4th June, not 4th July. And the next day is uh, Pani Hati, uh, the, the Hichira festival. Uh, from last 10 years, it's going on in uh, Atlanta, Pani Hati Dam. So can you please explain some uh, Leela about Sisi Jagannath? Jagannath Leela? Hmm. Well, when Krishna was in Dwarka, and he had been away from Vrindavan for so many years. The residents of Vrindavan were feeling so full of a, a transcendental separation and anxiety that all I could think about was bringing Krishna back. And they were sending messages to Krishna. The Krishna was staying in Dwarka, but at the same time, he was feeling really strong about going back to uh, to uh, Vrindavan. And even in the middle of the night, Krishna would somehow be chanting the names of the gopis or his mother. He would be singing, chanting Jai Radhe, or, and he would be longing to go back. And so some of the queens that were with Krishna and Dwarka were hearing all that. And they were thinking, wow, Krishna's with us, but he seems like he wants to be, he doesn't want to be with us. He wants to be with the residents of Vrindavan. So what is it about the residents of Vrindavan that are so special that Krishna wants to go back to them? So they were all wondering, so they decided to find out more. So they went to Rohini. Rohini was there. Rohini was the mother of Balaram. But she was also there when Krishna had his pastimes in Vrindavan when he was a young boy. So she knew Krishna's early pastimes, and she was also, in one sense, a resident of Vrindavan. Now she was staying in Dwarka. So all those the prominent queens got around Rohini and said, Rohini, please tell us Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. We want to hear those. Uh, we, they, we're so excited because... Krishna just loves Vrindavan so much. And she said, well, this is a problem. You know, if I start talking about Vrindavan and Krishna's pastimes, he's here now. He's going to leave. He's going to immediately leave and go back to Vrindavan. So you'll lose him. So they all thought, well, what can we do? Let's have a private session and we won't, we'll make sure Krishna doesn't come. So that was the plan. So they came to the assembly house and all the queens got there and Rohini was there. Then they had to have a guard at the door. So they decided to make Subhadra, Krishna's younger sister, the guard. She was supposed to guard it. And if Krishna got near, they would, she, he, she was supposed to alert everyone, Krishna's coming. So and then Rohini started to narrate. And as soon as she started to talk, the queens became more and more, as she continued on, absorbed. And everyone lost consciousness of everything around. And Subhadra at the door, she was also listening. And as she was listening, she went into ecstasy. And in that ecstasy, her hands and her legs coiled into her body. And she swooned in loving emotion and separation. And she lost consciousness. Now there was nobody guarding the door. And then after some time, nobody knew that what happened to Subhadra because they were all absorbed listening to Rohini. And then Lord Balaram, he comes and he sees the situation. He says, oh, he sees Subhadra there in ecstasy. And then he, oh, there's my mother. She's speaking about me and my brother. Let me listen. So... He starts to listening, and then his eyes start to roll in ecstasy, and his hands and legs 
coil within his body and he faints it out of love. And now Balaram is laying there also on the floor. And after some time, and nobody's even aware of what's going on around except they're listening to Rohini. And then what happens now is Krishna comes and he sees his younger sister and older brother just in ecstasy, unconscious. Oh, there's my mother, Mohini. She speak. Oh, she's talking about me. Let me listen. So, she st he starts listening, and then he he starts to go in ecstasy, and then he starts his eyes start to roll and get really big. They, get, they just expand like huge. And then his arms and legs coil into his body and he just falls onto the ground unconscious and nobody knows what happened. This is the this is the actual pastime which is preliminary to the Jagannath Rathri Yantra. Then when Krishna comes out of that state, he just wants to go back to Vrindavan. And then the trip from Dwarka to Vrindavan is the trip from uh, Aishwarya Bhav to Madhurya Rasa, to Madhurya Bhav, Vrindavan. So, and then that's described really nicely in the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, where Balaram and Subhadra, actually Balaram and, and Subhadra are leading the carts and taking Jagannath back or Krishna back to Vrindavan. Jagannath is actually the manifestation of Krishna in the mood of separation from his pure devotees. So we worship Krishna in that mood of Jagannath because he's in the mood of separating. You see, he, his arms and legs are coiled into his body and his eyes are big. This, ex, this is the mood that he exhibits when he is in ecstasy and separation from the devotees of Vrindavan. Wonderful, really wonderful. I'm saying on behalf of probably every devotee here. So, so nice, so wonderful. Thank you, Maharaj. That's Jagannath. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Jai Jai Jagannath, Jai Jai Baldeva, Jai Jai Subhadra Rani, Shila Prabhupada, Shila Gurudev, Kijay Kopinath Kijay. Thank you, Maharaj. Koti Koti Dandar Pana. Hare Krishna. Jai Jagannath, Baladev, Subhadra Maharani Kijay. Jai. Om Yilachala Nivesaya Nikya Paramatmane Balabhadra Subhadra Brah Jagannathaya Te Namaha. Pooja Mataji has been thanking you, Maharaj, for taking up his question from uh, uh, from uh, her son, who had who was asking questions on quantum world, and she also begs. She apologizes that he's new to devotion, so he doesn't have Vaishnava etiquette. So, if you could kindly bless her, bless him. Oh, I thought he was nice. <laughs> there you go, Pooja Mataji. Obviously, he is a. Scientists using the word quantum <laughs> or future scientists. <laughs> yes, I appreciated that question because it glorified, gave us a chance to glorify Srimad Bhagavatam. Any last minute questions for Maharaj? Alita Tangi. Alita Tangi Radha. I heard the Toronto Rathiatra is happening this year. Pataji, you have your video is not coming, and voice also. Yeah, you're 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 speaking, you're speaking without speaking. 
Mataji, your voice is not coming, Mataji. Push your Lali button. Tangi, Mataji, you are muted, I believe. Put your button, push your button on the computer. Her voice is not coming. She's in ecstasy, that's why she can't speak. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, Mataji. Okay, please. Finally, you, got, finally you came out of your ecstasy. Now you can speak. Okay. Maharaj, the way you. You're back in ecstasy again. <laughs> Not able to hear, dear Edgy Lalitangi Gopi. No, the, the, the device is in ecstasy, Maharaj. <laughs> it's okay. going on and off. It's a devious yeah. device. It's not a device, so the, it's devious. Uh, the, I had our, uh, requested the festival team to uh, reach out to you as you had uh, inquired uh, about it from me. So we are uh, waiting to serve you, Maharaj, here. Okay, I um, almost bought my ticket. Let's see. Okay, thank you. So we'll stop here and my obeisance to all of the devotees. Bancha Kalpa. Thank you.